Uh, well, hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us for the uh, University of Minnesota Extension and Sustainable Forest Education Cooperative uh, Forestry Webinars. Um, this one is becoming about an annual tradition, I think. Um, we've always had uh, someone talk about forest health issues um, in the state uh, at about this time of year. Uh, so it really happened that uh, Brian Schwindel with the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources is with us uh, today to talk about kind of a status of what's going on in Minnesota's forest uh, in regards to its forest health. Um, a quick note, uh, we do have a schedule of all the webinars for this year. Um, those are available on the My Minnesota Woods website and the SFEC website. Uh, you go and uh, we've got a great list of um, topics and webinars that are uh, coming up this year. Um, and also for those of you that are watching online, I uh, want to point you to the WebEx system that we use. Um, if you'd like to minimize the screen, uh, you can just go up to the top and click on that blue bar. And you should be able to uh, either minimize, you can see the chat area, uh, you can see um, who's speaking and, and some other things. Um, we're here in St. Paul, uh, and so Brian's going to get started here uh, soon. Um, we do encourage you to um, submit questions um, and comments as Brian's going through his talk. Um, Eli Sagor is here, um, and he will help to relay all those questions to Brian um, as we go through the presentation. Um, and so, um, with that, I think I'll turn it over to Brian. Brian's a forest health specialist of uh, the Central Region uh, with the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources, uh, and he's here to talk about uh, what's going on in Minnesota's forest health. So take it away, Brian. Thanks, Matt. And thanks, Eli, for the invite. The DNR appreciates sharing its little story in the world of forest health. Um, it's a good thing the majority of the audience is online because I just unfortunately spilled water on my pants in an unfortunate spot. I didn't have an accident, <laughs> but I can stand behind this podium and we're all good. Um, it is Valentine's Day, um, and so I must acknowledge the fact that entomologists have a lot of pictures of male and female insects getting to know one another. Um, but this is not just a gratuitous picture of mating insects, because in 2015, um, these insect, these longhorn beetles are called white spotted sawyers, and their population was very noticeable in northwestern Minnesota in 2015, and we got no reports of them in 2016. So that just indicates that whatever caused their population to spike in 2015 probably happened from 2013 through 2015, and it did not happen in 2015 or 2016. So um, that's all I have to say about that. Now this. Oops, this is a gratuitous picture of mating fungi, something that pathologists don't like to flout too much. And maybe you can see why it's just not very exciting. But anyways, that, that actually is a picture of um, two different mating types of, the, of a black mold fungus getting to know one another on this Valentine's Day. So, a little bit about our team. Um, last year, we were not at full strength, and now we are. We have Mike Parisio in, in the northwest part of the state, Jessica Hartshorn in the northeast, and I am in central and southern Minnesota, and then Val Cervec is our statewide coordinator. So that's our team, and I felt patriotic on that day when I made that territory map. Um, and we have a website that we are slowly updating. We just updated our Emerald Ashbor spot web page off of our Forest Health web page, and also this year we updated our Diplodia web page. Um, so we're working on it slowly but surely, and if you want to get newsletters about forest health conditions, you can sign up um, for our basically quarterly newsletters on that web page. Okay, so on to business. In 2016, we had a frost event that hit the entire state um, actually, the entire upper Midwest on May 14th and 15th, and this was a doozy. You can see the map on the right um, shows the last date of spring frost on May 15th. And actually, what's really fascinating is it was May 15th in, north, in the northwestern tip of Minnesota, and if you look at Wisconsin data, it was May 15th in Milwaukee too. And when you take a look at the last, the median last date of freeze. Um, you can see that that 2016 freeze event on May 14th and 15th was dramatically different than the median. 
um, date of last freeze for Minnesota, for mo almost all of Minnesota. And what did this do to the trees? Well, it, it killed expanding shoots. Um, frost damage, you can see that middle picture there of oaks. When you see that on oaks right after bud break, you, where the lower canopy is brown and the top of the canopy is green, that's almost always because of frost damage, because cold air sinks. And so it's more present closer to the ground. Um, and actually, a DNR forester took this fantastic picture of a state natural area near Hastings, where you can see all those brown trees in the lower line areas were oaks, and they had all their shoots killed. Now, this frost, um, some foresters in southeastern Minnesota were really concerned that it was going to mimic an event in the 90s where actually mature walnuts had serious branch death and, and mortality from a frost event in May then, but that didn't happen this year. There was no noted mortality, just shoot death. And going back here, the picture on the right there shows an oak just sending out a new shoot after the damage. So that was interesting. Um, also in 2016, right after that frost event, we had widespread ash leaflet drop. This was the second year in a row where this happened, but it wasn't nearly as bad or widespread as the ash leaflet drop in 2015. In 2015, it covered all of central and southern Minnesota. In 2016, it wasn't as severe, and it only happened in southeast Minnesota. And it happened right after that frost event. Um, I suspect that the reason this happened is, was because of a combination of, of a leaf fungal pathogen um, that's part of a group of pathogens called anthracnose. So those were present on the leaves prior to the frost damage, and the frost damage happened, and the trees responded by shedding a bunch of their leaves. So not a major concern for long-term tree health with that. But it was interesting. Um, the story this year in the majority of the growing season was throughout most of, almost all of Minnesota, we had way above average precipitation. So areas in green on, the, are on this map show precipitation above normal for actually the period of June through September. And what does this do for tree health? Well, it aids pretty much any fungal pathogen in disseminating and growing in population. And so there is this region-wide outbreak of a fungal shoot infection on oaks called Botryosphaeria shoot blight. And what it did was it killed new shoots of oaks. Um, the picture on the right there was, a, was a, a smaller oak near Little Falls, Minnesota that a DNR forester photographed. And that was about as bad as it got. Um, typically, and I don't know if you can even see this on, this, on the screen, but, but the, the shoot blight was kind of scattered throughout the canopy. So the fact that it extended from Brainerd all the way down to southwest Wisconsin at least strongly indicates it was weather-related. Um, most trees had subtle shoot blight, like I said. And we don't expect any long-term negative implications from this. But it's, you know, it's, this is something that is difficult to track. Um, not many people notice it. And it does bring up questions of, you know, if this goes on for 10 years, what are the impacts? So it's, it was noteworthy. Um, something that was very noteworthy was in the state of Minnesota and state of Wisconsin managed tree nurseries. Um, we saw a bunch of shoot blight caused by a fungal shoot uh, pathogen called Diplodia. And wet conditions favor the buildup of that disease. But, but typically trees have to be somewhat stressed to actually show disease or to show shoot blight. Um, we tested our nursery stock thoroughly, as did Wisconsin, and both states found that the latent infection, or essentially an, invis an invisible infection, um, was higher than we wanted. So both DNRs destroyed their three-year-old nursery stock because of this disease. Like I said, Diplodia is a threat to stressed red pine seedlings, essentially. So in terms of, a, we know very well how to avoid Diplodia. You don't plant red pine in the shade because shade stresses red pine. 
and you don't you want to avoid planting red pine in low line areas that we call frost pockets because the like I said before, cold air sinks and sometimes it accumulates in these subtly low areas in otherwise flat country and you can have abundant diplodia shoot blight after frost events like this low line frost pocket in Wisconsin. You can see all the brown shoots there from those trees dying of shoot, of shoot blight. Something else that was very interesting this year was across northeastern Minnesota, we saw a lot of needle rust on spruce trees. Um, needle rust is a, it's a fungal needle infection, and it can be one of many actual species of rust fun, fungi. But what it does is it causes yellowing of needles. Now, since it's Valentine's Day, here's another shot of fungi exchanging genetic material. And you can see maybe why pathologists don't show a lot in these pictures. You just see them in basic biology classes. But this is a picture of a different rust fungi, and this is where they're exchanging genetic material, maybe on Valentine's Day. And this same process happens on spruce needles. Um, like I said, it causes yellow spots. It can cause some needle drop. Um, in terms of kind of general forest ecology function and timber management, rust fungi are not a concern whatsoever. They can definitely be concerns for Christmas tree growers. Um, and I'll just say this right now, for, for timber production, it almost never makes economic sense to apply a insecticide or fungicide to, to reduce problems with insects or fungi. Um, but certainly it does when we're talking about Christmas tree production and for just about any fungus, fungal pathogen or insect pest, you can find a chemical that will kill it. But again, in terms of forest management, which, I, which we focus on in the DNR, it almost never makes economic sense to use those things. OK, so this wet summer made conditions pretty favorable for another broadleaf fungal leaf disease called burr oak blight. What was really interesting, though, is that you know, when you take a look at meteorological data for regions, it's general. And it doesn't get at what an individual point on the planet experienced. So this, this bur oak is a bur oak in Zimmerman, Minnesota. And when I asked the DNR forester for the precipitation records for Zimmerman, what was really interesting is that actually in 2015, from May through August of 2015, it was much wetter than in 2016. And I think that explains why you don't see as much disease in 2016 on this individual bur oak than in 2015. And I just think this speaks to the point, again, that wet conditions favorable a lot more leaf disease buildup. <clears throat> um, there's a lot of concern with burrow blight in the state. Um, but I think uh, a big take-home message, particularly for um, people who own like a shade tree or a yard tree that's a burrow, is that burrow can sustain significant defoliation from burrow blight for many years in a row at least seven and eight. And I suspect that they can, they can sustain defoliation because with burr oak blight, you typically don't see the oaks dropping leaves until later August or September. And if a tree maintains most of its canopy green up until that point, it's done pretty good for the year. And so you aren't typically going to see a significant impact on an individual tree unless there's something else going on, something else that's stressing the tree. And this is just a, a hypothesis of mine, um, but a lot is not known about Baroque blight. There's a hypothesis that some Baroques are genetically more tolerant to the, the tree or not. That's never been demonstrated in the literature. Um, but a main message is that uh, if you have a Baroque that's suffering from Baroque blight, don't cut it down. Wait until the following spring to see how much of the canopy is actually dead. Because it might look very dead in September or October, but maybe the entire canopy is still living. Um, down in the, the bottom right of this slide, I, I, I put this note up here that said Burr Oak Blight, Bob, for short, was first noticed in Iowa and Minnesota in the mid-90s. 
And you can see, just if you took it, take a look at the long-term precipitation record of central Minnesota, the green areas here are, are a five-year moving average. So above, it, so green areas indicate longer-term moist spells. The, the gray line indicate, indicates individual precipitation for the month of April. And so you can see since the mid, uh, the early 90s, we've set a lot of near records for April precipitation. In other words, it's been really wet recently. South Central Minnesota, it's the, the um, trend in above average precipitation in April is even, is even more obvious. And Baroques just so happened to leaf out oftentimes in mid-April. And so if you're having really moist conditions in mid-April, that's providing a really favorable climate for bur oak blight, um, the, the pathogen to increase in its population and spread. Just a little note on heterobacidian root disease. This is what it can do to a plantation. It, causes, it can cause these disease centers. A lot of other problems in our pine plantations can do the same thing. So from the air, they'll look the same. Um, heterobacidian produces these uh, on that mossy topped conch in the upper right. You can see a, a, a fungal conch there near the ground line. That's very indicative of heterobacidian root disease, and that's the fruiting structure. And the, the picture on the lower right shows the pore surface on the underside, and it's very white. But we've looked very hard for this fungus in cooperation with the <coughs> University of Minnesota and University of Wisconsin throughout the state. And you can see after a survey, pretty intensive surveys from 2014 through 2016, we still only know of the one confirmed spot in northern Winona County. You can see that red dot there in Winona County. And because we've invested so much time and effort in surveying for this disease and we came up empty-handed, we've decided to eradicate the spot. And I was just at this spot last week, so we, we cut down all of the red pines. And in the spring, we're going to rip out the stumps in and near the, the former disease center, and we're going to burn them. Because if you just leave them on site, those stumps will continue to produce fruiting bodies and spores that can spread in the area. So at the very least, we're reducing the local population of heterobacidian in southeast Minnesota. However, I recommend to anybody in southeast Minnesota who wants to, to grow pine trees into perpetuity, and that includes the next generation of pines that they'll plant, if you want to maintain, or if you want to minimize um, the risk of heterobacidian on your land, I highly recommend preventing heterobacidian. And there are a couple tools that you can, you can use to prevent heterobacidian. One is thinning only in the wintertime in the dead of winter. That doesn't eliminate all risk, but it eliminates a lot of risk. The other one is to, is to apply a, an improved fungicide on stumps immediately after cutting. So you can go to our website to see some details on those prevention actions. Okay, on a little bit to our aerial survey, um, and I want to give a shout out to Gentry Carlson with the DNR and Mark Roberts with the United States Forest Service. They did almost all of these surveys that you can see in the hash area of Minnesota, and it's not the most pleasant of jobs. It can get really hot and really bumpy in those small plains, and um, you can get delayed by weather, and you can miss your kids' football games. So... Thanks to those guys. Just a note here on some missed areas in, in far northern Minnesota. That area in eastern Cooch County and northwestern St. Louis County was missed because of a series of del uh, weather delays. Um, we can't fly in small aircraft if, if a thunderstorm is anywhere near because they can produce some very severe um, winds. Um, these areas weren't surveyed because we simply don't have enough time or people power to fly. Um, so those areas will be surveyed in the future. Okay, <clears throat> I'd like to give you some warnings about interpreting aerial survey data. So keep in mind these surveys are done about 1,000 feet above the ground going about 100 miles an hour. And it's not easy to place, to, draw, to copy, or to, to transfer what you see on the ground happening to a map, essentially a map. So typically, um, effect, the polygons or affected locations are 
are within about 100 meters of reality. Um, and keep in mind that a lot of tree problems, like all of the tree problems I've covered to this point, really can't be seen from aircraft. And there are probably hundreds of others that cannot be seen. Um, most of the polygons are not ground truth. I think we came up with maybe perhaps 10,000 polygons of data, and there are essentially three of us to check those out. And a lot of those are in impossible to reach locations. So keep that in mind. We do our best with interpreting the data. Tree, now this is really important. Tree health within polygons and between polygons is highly variable. So that if you're looking at two polygons side by side, one polygon, maybe 100% of the trees were impacted in that polygon, and its nearest neighbor, maybe only 2% of the trees were impacted. But maybe two, those 2% 2 of the trees were affected 100% of their canopies, but in the, in the polygon where 100% of the trees were impacted, maybe only, on average, 10% of their canopies were affected. So caution with interpretation of our data. Um, the other thing is not all canopy problems are possible to detect every year. We have storm delays. Sometimes if we fail to get up in the air within two weeks of an insect defoliation event, we can't see it any longer because of rains. Um, you know, we can't fly the same spot on the ground year at, um, every year or twice a year. You know, sometimes you might fly over a parcel of land and then a huge fire happens the next day. Okay, now of the caveats. Here are the top five disturbers as we recorded them from the air in 2016. Spruce budworm was up from 2015. Eastern larch beetle was way up from 2015, about double what it was in 2015. And then we had a lot of wind damage. Um, we were not able to map black ash decline for reasons I won't go into. Um, so a little bit about each of these. There's been an outbreak of eastern larch beetle going on since about 2000 or 2001 in the state of Minnesota. Um, and all those black areas are areas that we have mapped over the years that have been impacted by this critter. Just because you see uh, a black area on that map doesn't mean that the forest has been devastated. All it means is that that forest has been affected by eastern larch beetle at least in one of those years, between 2001 and 2015. Here, the red areas show um, the, the damage from eastern March beetle in 2016. If we look at that, though, now I did say that, that the area affected by eastern March beetle doubled from 2015 to 2016, but something to keep in mind is that 96% of that area, the forests within 90% of that area essentially are fine. Or I shouldn't say are fine, it's just that the vast majority of the trees in those polygons are fine. So here's just a, a graphic showing you how um, eastern larch beetle doesn't appear to be going away at all. And here's the accumulated acreage that has been affected by eastern larch beetle since 2001. Um, just, so we're looking at about 282,000 acres. That just happens to almost equal the size of Upper and Lower Red Lake. Now, something I don't show here is when you take a look at the, the, the polygons or the area that has been affected by eastern larch beetle severely in the state, where we've marked over 50% of the trees have been killed, that area equals roughly the size of Leech Lake. <clears throat> so we've had some seriously devastated forests from eastern larch beetle. Now, I will point out that the larch beetle outbreak started around 2000. You can see in the lower right, I, I wrote that in there. And you can also see since about 1980, we've set the record for spring, per spring temperature. This is a map of temperature, so red equals um, long-term above average temperature. In north central Minnesota, you can just see that the spring has been warm. This pattern holds true for winter and fall too. In other words, the growing season has gotten longer and this, as the University of Minnesota has demonstrated, has 
aided the population growth of eastern large beetle. Okay, on to another critter. The large case bearer is, a little, is the little caterpillar that sucks the juices out of tamarack needles. Um, you can see where we mapped um, large case bearer defoliation on the map on the left. The map on the right shows the trees kind of look straw-like, or the tree foliage looks a little straw-like in the spring shortly after leaf elongation or neo elongation. That's a good indicator of large case bearer. There's a picture of the large case bearer in the upper left there, and here's the kind of the defoliation trend over the years. And what's very interesting is that large case bearer has also been on a rampage since 2000-ish. Um, I believe the University of Minnesota, I know they have, they've put out some grants to look at why this has been, and I don't think that they have received grant funding for those projects. Which is unfortunate because we, we really, um, you know, the forest health team with the DNR, we can monitor the forests, but what we don't have the staff to or the expertise is to necessarily look into why we're seeing these trends. And that's where um, university researchers can really help us out. So this is a big question why large case bear is, is having a heyday in Minnesota. On to spruce budworm. Spruce budworm is a caterpillar that loves to eat balsam fir. Um, it also likes to eat white spruce. And it's always present in the Arrowhead region of Minnesota. And since about 2014, the area between Ely and basically two rivers has seen an outbreak of spruce budworm. Here's the area that's been impacted in 2014 and 15. Um, and here's the area that has been impacted in 2016. So essentially we mapped the new areas that have been impacted in 2016 essentially are around two harbors uh, along the shore and along two rivers. I think, I think I have my city names right there. Now, on to more confusion. Um, you know, we mapped about 200 square miles of impacted forest. Now, when you take a look at that forest, most of those, most of that area, over 50% of the of the trees were not impacted. Possibly because a lot of them were aspen, so they were non-hosts for spruce budworm. But when you take a look at what trees within those polygons were defoliated very heavy, you can see that it was a lot up by Ely which means that balsam firs up there and, and white spruce, they're going to start dying. And, and actually, a lot of them are already dead and dying. And so for, for timber management, it would be a good idea to, to try and salvage the value of the trees up there or pre-salvage the value of the trees up there because this outbreak is probably going to persist there for another three to five years. And there's the defoliation and mortality trend that we've mapped. On to jack pine budworm. Jack pine budworm is a very, very close relative of the spruce budworm, but jack pine budworm prefers to eat jack pine. And in 2015, we saw a pretty big uptick in affected jack pines from basically little, well, Camp Ripley area up towards Bemidji. And we thought in 2016 it was really going to blow up, and it did not. Um, when you take a look at the defoliation trend, you, you can see that there was a little dip in 2016. We have no idea what's going to happen with um, the 2017 population. It could go back up. It, it might crash. Um, a couple weeks ago, I drove between Motley and Walker. And essentially, most of the jack pines along the roadway there had been nibbled in 2016 by jack pine budworm. And so that nibbling probably wasn't visible from aircraft. And so I suspect that our 2016 value of affected acres there is a, is a pretty sizable underestimate. Plus, um, severe storms delayed our flights <clears throat> and a plane repair delayed our flights for a good two weeks so that by the time we actually were able to survey, a lot of the foliage had either, 
a lot of the foliage that these little budworms like to clip off and they tie up there with their webbing. If you have heavy rains, a lot of that washes off and you can't see the, the impact of defoliation from a good distance. And I will just point out that that tiny caterpillar on someone's shoulder there in that picture, that shoulder is Mike Parisio's shoulder. And that's how tiny those caterpillars are in early June, late May. They're very hard to find. On to forest tank caterpillar. Now, we might be seeing on that picture on the right there some brotherly or sisterly love. Or maybe it's a future romance waiting to happen. Um, you know, I will point out that caterpillars don't mate. They're the immature stage of insects. It's the moths that mate. Anyway, I had to say that because it is Valentine's Day. Um, we didn't have much forest tank caterpillar defoliation in 2016. Um, when you take a look at the forest where the majority of the trees were actually impacted by defoliation, the only spot that really sticks out is that spot near Orr in northern St. Louis County. And that spot has been a, a hotbed of forest tank caterpillar activity for the last several years. And that happens occasionally in the state. We're not sure why there are these hotbeds of forest tank caterpillar populations, but they exist. So that area right there, you will probably start seeing mortality, if not already, um, in upcoming years or next year. <clears throat> so maybe they did get married. I don't know. But you can see here the defoliation trend is pretty um, ambiguous. We don't know what's going to happen with forest tank counter. But fortunately, the impact right now to Minnesota's forest by forest tank caterpillar is not great. On to emerald ash borer. Um, the blue dots in Minnesota are confirmed infested ash trees. Provide, and this data comes from Minnesota Department of Ag. And you can access this online and at the Minnesota Geospatial Commons database. And, um, what was, I guess, the news of emerald ash borer detections in 2016 was that it was confirmed in mainland Duluth in 2016. Um, and then I added Wisconsin's data, too. Now, Wisconsin is just keeping track of infested townships. I believe those are townships. And that picture on the left there um, is when you see, the, you can see the light bark color on that on that ash. And that is a result of woodpeckers removing the outer bark and kind of drilling down into the wood to feed on the immature stage and the damaging stage of the emerald ash borer, which is the larva. Now, when you see that woodpecker feeding on big ash trees, you can't be totally confident that that is a result of, of emerald ash borer, particularly in areas of the state where emerald ash borer has not been confirmed. We have all kinds of native wood borers, and there are a couple native at least two native ash bark beetles that really can draw in woodpecker feeding. But when you see woodpecker feeding on an ash that small, it should really um, make you take note. And I recommend the easiest way to confirm emerald ash borer is simply to remove the bark and look at the surface of the wood and the inner bark. And if you have those sinuous ash-shaped feeding tunnels or galleries, you can almost be assured that is from emerald ash borer because there's really no other native insect that does that to ash at that density. We decided this year to see if we could actually map the impact of emerald ash borer from the air over Houston and Winona counties in southeastern Minnesota, and we could. The picture on the right there shows a typical mixed hardwood forest of southeastern Minnesota, and any, any tree that doesn't have leaves on is a dead ash tree. And um, we mapped roughly 3,500 acres of noticeable um, mortality of ash from the air. Now keep in mind, the majority, almost all of the forests in southeastern Minnesota are not pure ash at all. In fact, ash is a, mi a minor component of the forests down there. Um, so the 95% of that area, 95% of those 3,500 acres, um, is actually indicates less than 30% of the forest is actually affected. And that just speaks to the point that ash isn't a really common tree species down there. 
So in other words, it, you know, it looks really bad when you take a look at a map like this, but it's not that bad. It's bad for the ash, though. There's widespread noticeable infestation and mortality of ash in that area. Um, we oftentimes map declining aspen and aspen birch stands in the state, and that's been on the downswing. And the reason for that is because lately we've been having adequate precipitation in the growing season, and a lot of our declining aspen stands have been salvaged for timber production and, and um, forest regeneration. We saw a lot of wind damage in Minnesota in 2016. You can see uh, there is really severe uh, wind damage to forests up in the Boundary Waters Canoe area, but also all across the north and the grayed out areas, those indicate areas that we were not able to aerial survey, and there was a lot of wind damage further south too into Pine County and I believe all the way down to the Twin Cities. Um, here's my earth, wind, and fire slide, although it's not earth, it's flood, wind, and fire. I just took a look at our, our aerial survey data at looking at these, these non-biotic damaging agents and to see if there's any trend. I, I don't think we can, we can take away really anything significant of trends in this data because of all the caveats I already told you about with our aerial survey data. But it does show, I mean, I was really surprised that in 2016 we mapped with the black um, polka dot bars, those indicate wind. We mapped almost as much wind damage in the state as we did in 2011. In 2011 was when the giant blowdown event occurred around the 4th of July and it started in um, Pine County near Hinckley. It affected the state forest there and it went all the way to, in almost all the way to um, Ashland, Wisconsin. So that was a giant wind event. And we almost mapped more than mapped as much wind damage this year as back then. Um, and we mapped a lot of flood damage. We had tons of precipitation in, in the state. And that, um, the blue squigglies there, indicate flood, flooded forests. And keep in mind, we didn't even map any of the flooded forests in the southern two-thirds of the state. So that's a drastic underestimate. On to oak wilt. The red dots indicate where we confirmed and tracked um, positive oak wilt confirmations in 2016. You can see oak wilt got frighteningly close to Carleton County. Um, and fortunately, the landowners in northern Pine County are attempting to eradicate oak wilt on their land up there. Um, just a note here, I, I like to buffer all of the confirmed areas of the state of Oakville with, with about 20 miles because, of my, because in my experience, if you're within about 20 miles of a, no, of a confirmed Oakville spot, you have a very good chance of having Oakville infection if you nick up or damage an oak from, well, in May and June or from April through mid-July. There's a good chance of it. So I don't recommend touching an oak in that period if you're in if you're in the gray zone because there's a significant risk. Just a little bit on on identifying oak wilt um, amongst red oak species, so black oaks, northern red oaks, northern pin oaks, and all of their hybrids. If you see an oak go from 100 percent healthy in May to 99 percent leaf loss and that leaf loss occurs within about a month and the leaves that fall, you'll see totally green leaves that fall, you'll see totally brown leaves that fall, and then you'll see a lot of leaves that have this brown or bronze margin. If you see the combination of all those on red oak, there's nothing else that does that to red oaks besides oak wilt. Oak wilt, after, from infection to death, you can get, that takes about two months. It can take two months. Could, it could take three months with red oak species. It's a very drastic disease on red oak species. Now, I'm not, I'm not going to go into identifying oak wilt on white oak and bur oak because it's much more challenging. Um, but again, here's just a progression of roughly two months where a tree went from 100% leaved canopy to a lot of leaf loss throughout the entire canopy over 
probably over 80%. That's Oak Grove. Now, just a message. I hear from people all over the state that they just cut down their trees that are wilting in the summertime. That is the last thing you want to do. Because all that does is it actively pushes oak wilt into neighboring oaks. You can spread oak wilt across the landscape very fast by doing that. So just wait until total tree dormancy and frozen ground conditions to remove the oaks that wilted. And then you're going to have to deal with their wood because their wood has a very good chance of producing spores of oak wilt that can in fact damage oak wilts within a quarter mile the following year. Please go to our website to learn more on how to deal with infected wood. The other thing I'll say is oak wilt can be controlled. It's a controllable forest disease, but you have to address the below ground spread and the above ground spread. And if you don't do both of those, you are not going to control oak wilt on your property. It's a complicated disease to work with, so I recommend working with a very experienced and professional person. And when they give you recommendations, do everything they say, because you cannot just do half of the things they say and think that you're going to control oak wilt, because you're not. Okay, now, if you're wondering, if you're in one of those counties that we know that has oak wilt, and you're wondering if you have oak wilt, I highly suggest you submit a sample to a lab like the University of Minnesota Plant Disease Diagnostic Clinic. Because unless you're able to sit and watch a given oak drop all of its leaves over a month, which most of us don't have the privilege to do, it's, you just can't go to an oak and see that it's dead and assume that it has oak wilt. Other things can do that to oak wilt, or other things can do that to oaks. If you are outside of a known infested zone in the state and you think you have oak wilt, please call your local DNR forestry office or please report it with this app, formerly known as the Great Lakes Early Detection Network app. <coughs> now it's EDD Maps Midwest. You can download it on Android and Apple devices. Okay, a little bit about two-line chestnut borer. This is kind of a fascinating story, I think. And I want you to focus on this spot in Minnesota, that circle spot right in the middle of of Minnesota. That's around Little Falls. Here's a precipitation, um, essentially the, the precipitation record from October through, from August through October 2011. And you can see that it was about 70 percent, well 50 to 90 percent below average. The next year, 2012, we saw another late growing season severe drought where that same area in the state suffered precipitation deficits at 20 to 30 percent of normal. Now, 2013 through 2015, in that area, general area, also saw late growing season droughts. But in that specific area, there, it was about normal. Okay, so here's the deal with Tulane Chestnut Boar. Now, this is, an this is an incomplete data, but this is what we know. You can see Tulane Chestnut Boar has affected oak forests in central Minnesota right around Little Falls, up towards Brainerd, in a pretty significant way. Now, when you take a look at some of these stands, it's pretty remarkable what two-line chestnut board or drought has done. Here's an image of, of this stand in 2013. This is an infrared, color infrared um, image. So when you see red on a color infrared image, that means the vegetation is pretty healthy, essentially. So you don't see a lot of black, green, or brown in that image. But when you zoom forward to 2015, you can see a lot. So I'm going to kind of scroll back and forth, and you can see the change in that forest. And that forest is just absolutely loaded with two-line chestnut borer. I should have stated at the beginning that two-line chestnut borer, it's, an, it's a native insect pest of oak, and it's a cambium feeder. So it essentially cuts off the piping that brings the food um, that is produced by the root, by the leaves elsewhere in the tree. And it'll kill a tree in about two to three years. Okay, here's a different spot northeast of Little Falls. That's the image of that forest in 2013, and this is what it looked like in 2015. So we have massive losses of oaks because of two-line chestnut borer in central Minnesota. And I like to blame it on the droughts. Because two-line chestnut borer, 
Um, it's a native insect, and it almost never goes after oaks that are not stressed. It really likes to feed on on oaks that have been defoliated by two by you know you name the the caterpillar that defoliates oaks. It, its population generally increases after a caterpillar has defoliated, or after a you know a caterpillar goes into outbreak mode in a given area. It, its population goes up drastically after droughts too. Now, the, the difficult thing here is that we're trying to, to map, or we're trying to find and confirm where oak wilt is reaching into northern Minnesota. And what's unfortunate about this spot in central Minnesota is that it's very, very difficult to distinguish between oak wilt and two-line chestnut board if you're, if you're flying over it, if you're looking at imagery, or if you're actually driving by a stand and just seeing it at one point in time. Because two-line chestnut borer can kill oaks in a single growing season if those oaks are very stressed. There are very subtle differences between diagnosing two-line chestnut borer and oak oak. But essentially, this slide says it all. The, pick, the oak on the left um, was killed by oak wilt, and it died in about a month. And you can see it produced leaves at the very tip of its outer canopy at the beginning of the growing season. In contrast, that the, the oak on the right, its outer canopy probably was killed by two-line chestnut borer the previous year. And then you can see all of those dead leaves in the, in the middle and lower canopy hanging on, which is pretty characteristic of, of two-line chestnut borer. And then you can't see it in this image, but there are green leaves actually in the very lower part of that tree. Now, if you just went to this forest and looked at this, you could not be sure that this is not oak wilt. You would have to return to the forest in a couple weeks and look to see if that tree still had green leaves in the lower canopy to confirm two line chestnut board. Okay. That's all I have. Great. Brian, thanks. Uh, yes. We have only one question. Oh, here, someone just submitted a million dollar question. Nice. I read that one. Yeah, so I'll give you the, uh, the cheap one. I think first. I know who that is. Um, it seems we had a pretty poor acorn year in 2016. Uh, do you expect a 2016 region wide Botrysferia infection will impact acorn production in 2017? Good question. The DNR got a ton of questions this year about what happened to the acorn crop. And I can tell you that the, the um, mid-May frost didn't help the acorns, or excuse me, it didn't help the oaks in their efforts to produce acorns. Um, it may have killed flowers that eventually would have been acorns. That might have had something to do with it. Um, also, oaks produce um, acorn crops in a very um, stochastic or kind of random way, so it's very difficult to predict um, bumper acorn crop years. Um, I don't think there's a relationship between the Botrysferia outbreak and the 2016 lack of acorn production. And I'd be very surprised if it's going to impact the 2017 acorn crop. Because even on those trees that were impacted by Botrysferia, probably less than maybe 10% of their shoots were actually killed. So there's still, those trees are still going to have the majority of their shoots that have the potential to produce flowers and acorns in 2017. All right, uh, the million dollar question. <clears throat> The part of uh, the EAB population expansion that's scary is the inflection point where populations begin to build exponentially. Management can't keep up at that point. In infested areas of southeast Minnesota, between Twin Cities and Rochester, do you have a sense for how far from that inflection point we might be? In short, no. I don't know where we're at in the inflection curve. I suspect that we're well beyond the inflection curve in southeastern Minnesota and, and in southeastern Minnesota. You know, a, a wise forester who had a lot of experience managing forests with ash 
and with Emerald Ash Borer told me one time that about six years after the initial confirmation of Emerald Ash Borer in an area, you'll have widespread noticeable infestation of ash trees. And that is exactly what we're seeing in southeastern Minnesota. It was first confirmed in, in 2009 in Houston County along the river. And 9 plus 6 is 15. And, and so we, we, we looked at the kind of the widespread nature of emerald ash borer infestation seven years after the fact, and we found, yes, you have widespread infestation. And that indicates to me that the population is really high in southeastern Minnesota. Because something to keep in mind is you don't have canopy. You don't see canopy symptoms of emerald ash borer infestation until the insect has been in the tree for at least two years. So once you actually see impact in the canopy, so dieback, um, it, the, the, the insect has been there for a number of years. All right, at this point, I don't see any other questions, surprisingly. We've got a good group here. Any questions from within the room? Brian, I'll just mention that the University of Minnesota Forest Entomology Lab is working on large case bear. We're not funded by the University of Minnesota, but we are working on it. And uh, we are trying to tease apart whether it is due to a failure of a biological control program that began in the 1960s or whether it's climatic effects. And we've got two years of data, and we're about a year away from nailing some of this down. So stay tuned. Neat. Maybe a future webinar. I hope so. On whether biological, just in case people didn't hear this online, University of Minnesota um, has been looking into the dynamics of large case bear between the large case bear population and its biological control agents. Biological control was effective and introduced in Minnesota in the 1970s. So they're looking into whether there's a failure of biological control, whatever, for some reason, and also climate impacts. And they're going to be close to some answers maybe next year. And Brian, going back to EAB, do you feel confident if EAB spreads and using the aerial survey technique kind of outside of the southeast uh, to monitor for EAB in the future? And, yeah, good question. Aerial survey is not a, a tool that we can use to detect emerald ash borer at an early stage of infestation. It's a tool we can use to um, document widespread general impact of emerald ash borer to the general forest canopy in the future. We could do that in the, over the Twin Cities. Generally, we don't like to fly over the Twin Cities metro area because we run into challenges with Minneapolis-St. Paul International Airport. <laughs> but um, we, we could look into that. And certainly, you know, in six years, seven years, eight years, <laughs> Um, I would expect that we will be seeing an impact of emerald ash borer in the Duluth area. I don't know if I answered your question, hopefully. I mean, I, I think with, with emerald ash borer and so many of these, I mean, even with oak wilt, um, for early, early detection, I think we are reliant on, on citizens being aware and reporting to um, professionals when they are concerned that they have infestation. I always talk about the exam the, the two ash trees in front of my office. Um, I noticed in February 2016 woodpecker feeding on the on the lower trunk of this big ash tree in front of my office. And until that point I didn't know it was infested with emerald ash borer. But the fact that it had feeding in 2015 in the lower trunk tells me that that tree had been infested for two years and there were absolutely no canopy symptoms before that or in 2016. It had a totally healthy looking canopy. So we, we just were re really reliant on people to look for woodpecker feeding and, and investigate and then report for Emma Lashmore. Any other questions from the audience? Well, if not, thank you, Brian, for your webinar.